Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, hello. Um, I'm Kate Moss. It's my great pleasure uh, to be here to welcome you to the last of the pre-show talks for the Hidden History series. Um, as you know, there has been a, a wonderful strand of programming here in the Minerva uh, this year, which has been about teasing particular unknown or untold moments of history and bringing them to life on the stage for all of us. Um, and I just want to know, although I... Um, I, there's loads of you here, it's wonderful. Who has already had the pleasure of seeing the show? Are you putting your own hand up there, Mark? <laughs> yes, <laughs> good. So a few. Who is going in tonight? And shall I make my usual joke about who hasn't bought a ticket? Do we want that joke again? We don't need that joke, because you're all going in. Um, so we've got a few, but... Not that we're talking about spoilers now. Spoilers, yes. We just have to be careful about the spoilers. Um, well, we're going to follow uh, the usual format that Mark and I are going to talk as if you were not there um, for about 25 minutes, and then there'll be time for some questions, and then we will clear the house um, at 20 to 7 so that the players can come back in. Um, so, Mark, hello. 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 Um, it's so exciting to interview. Um, someone who has a debut play as a fellow writer, uh, but also a play that I went in on the first night, the first preview, and I think it's just fabulous. Um, so I've been waiting to ask you all the things that I genuinely, you know, sometimes you sit there thinking, I'd better ask about that, uh, <laughs> because there's nothing I really want to know. Whereas this, um, one of the things that is so extraordinary, I think, is that the Second World War, of course, is a period of history we all think we know very well. Uh, we have seen much and read much and listened to much, but I genuinely didn't know the story of Hans Litten, um, except for your documentaries. And these were, I remembered them, but I hadn't got it in front of my mind. So you've done two documentaries about this period of history before the war started, set in Germany, teasing out the story of this lawyer. Could you just say a little bit about the basic inspiration for the play and why you wanted to come back to it in theatre form yeah. and revisit the story. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I, I didn't want to do it. It, it was actually, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was somebody, I wanted to do something else, that's often the way. I just, I just uh, uh, pr uh, produced a documentary about Robespierre and the French Revolution. And the commissioning editor at the BBC, Martin Davidson, who's, who, who liked the film, said, uh, what do you want to do next? I said, I want to do something on Roger Casement. He said, no, no, don't, wait, don't do that, do this. And uh, he mentioned Hans Litten's name. Uh. And I went, you know when someone, when you think you should know something, but you, you don't know it. I, I wanted to go, yeah, yep. Yeah. But luckily I didn't. I just said, well, who, who, the, who the hell is that? <laughs> and he said, I thought you knew something about the Third Reich. I must have been saying I'd studied at a, a, a university or something. And he said, well, and he told me who this guy was. And I, I, first of all, I just thought, He's exaggerating. If this man had cross-examined Hitler in a Berlin court two years before Hitler came to power, I think I would have heard of that somewhere. So I rushed home, and he was virtually asking me to do the thing. So I, I, was, I was, of course, excited. Rushed home, checked, checked the books on the shelves, had all the standard works that are on, the Nazi, on Nazi Germany that have been published in the last 10 years, by Richard Evans, by Ian Kershaw, uh, etc. And I looked in the index, and he wasn't there, no Hans Litton. Wow. So I, at first I thought, he's, he's exaggerating, but I also thought, there's a bit of me now was exciting. This probably wasn't a, 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 a genuinely new story. Luckily, I did have, I am a bit of a nut, I suppose, for this period of history. I had some 1930s <laughs> books written on Hitler, Hitler's Germany by exiles, political exiles, Germans who come to England and written in English to really educate uh, English men and women and British people about what was happening in Nazi, Nazi Germany. Hans Litton wasn't just a footnote in his books, he, he was a chapter. Clearly there was something about this case that uh, was very resonant at the time. I think why we haven't uh, heard of him, mm. uh, unless you, 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 you happen to see the drama in the doc that I, that I made, uh, I think why he disappeared from history was, he was his, his name became subsumed within everything that happened after his own uh, demise. That's to say, the Holocaust wiped everything clean. It didn't. What it did, of course, was add six million victims to, to Hans Litten and, and his hundreds of uh, colleagues who, 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 who suffered with him in the 1930s. So that very individual story got lost in the general tragedy of the Holocaust and the war. 
But uh, of course, when I started digging, there were, it, it was quite a considerable story. Mm, mm. You asked why, why, the, why the play. So, I, I, yeah, I made a drama on it and I made a documentary on it and I, I was thinking, that, that's probably enough now. Some, a West End producer came and, and, and uh, phoned me literally two or three days after the thing had gone out on BBC Two and said, would you like to make a stage play? And I'd never, made a, I'd never written for the stage before. And I also thought, I can't go through this again. It's, uh, what, what, what do you, because it was very emotionally upsetting or demanding when you say you didn't want to go through it again? That's, I think there, were, there was a bit of that. That's, mm. if you like, the romantic reason. The, 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 the pragmatic reason was I thought, I, I thought I'd exhausted the subject. Right. But actually, and he, got, he helped me to think it through. I, I said, well, actually, when I went out to Germany and I, I made the documentary what, about what happened to Hans in the concentration camps, his mother was obviously was a much bigger figure than I'd appreciated. And I met the mother's, uh, his, his mother's grand, granddaughter, who's still alive, and I met people who'd known her. And she became a real figure for me. So when I mentioned this to Mark Goucher, the producer, he said, well, let's make it about her. So in a sense, that, that's, that's what the stage play is. It, it's a whole, it's a, it, in, a, it, in one sense, it's a continuation of the drama on BBC Two, if you saw that. It, carries on, the, uh, on, literally on the week that the drama ends. But then there's a fo the focus has shifted slightly away from Hans to this incredible, indomitable woman who did her best to release her son. And to do that, had to negotiate with the Gestapo. Yes, and I mean, those of you, I mean, this is not giving anything away, but anybody here who is a parent, let alone a mother, there was an awful lot of sniffling around when I was watching the play. There was an awful <laughs> yeah. lot of, oh, my God. Because you can think of your own mum, can't you? Yes. I, my yeah. mother's here. Hello, mummy. There you go. Um, but, um, who is indomitable, obviously. Um, but, but actually, going, um, think, thinking about that, this was one of the things that was so, for me, shining about the play, that what makes us respond to a story we think we know? Well, it's a different sort of light on it. Yeah. And because it is about a mother and a son, and it could be any of us, yeah. um, it is both specific, absolutely specific, and universal. And that was an amazing thing to see. Well, I'm glad you say that, because that, that, that was one of the objectives uh, in, in, writing, in writing the play, to make her every woman. I, I, I mean, I don't think every parent, no matter how much they love their children, would necessarily do what Ermgard did. She had an advantage. She, 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 she was, uh, she, as she says in the play, I'm a woman of some social standing. Uh, so she wasn't intimidated in the way that many women, many parents might have been by the Gestapo, obviously were by the Gestapo, because they had no reputation. They had no status. Nobody knew them. Ermgard had some status, especially in Prussia, which is, Berlin is obviously the capital of Prussia. But I also think she... They, at the same time, there is something you, you hope mothers do this, and of course they do, they do because she, Ermgard, in some ways, I, I think I said this in in the program actually, where, where, where Ermgard is the, if you like, the forerunner of some of those mothers who got together in Argentina and Chile after Pinochet came to power in, in, in Chile and the Junta came to power in Argentina. Thousands of uh, political activists of Hans's age, often. Hans was 29 when he was disappeared. Thousands of those kids disappeared. And the parents, do you remember? They, mm, they, they organised yeah. and they got together yeah. and they bore witness outside the secret police headquarters in Santiago of Buenos Aires. The same incident is happening in Tehran now uh, to the kids who were disappeared in the 2008 Green Revolution. And it's usually the mothers, which is interesting, mm. Uh, and that's part of what the play tries to explore. Why is it mum, not dad, who, who always sees it through to the bitter end? I probably won't say any more about that because... No, no, because yeah. then we do. Yeah. But also, I, I thought that what you had done very cleverly with that is, again, because we are an audience that knows what is going to happen, so there is a terrible poignancy to that, yeah. but we also know that part of that will be the cult of German motherhood. Yes. And that, I thought, was very clever, that it's yes. never stated that this is actually going to suddenly be celebrated in this way. That's right, yeah. um, But one of the other things that I really loved was that, uh, as well as, obviously, the central characters of, 
the mother and the son. Of course, there is the father and there's the young Gestapo officer. Um, and we are told the bits of history that some people will know more than others about the SA, the thugs, and then they were in their turn purged, all of these things. But the way that you write the scenes between the mother and the Gestapo chief, there is a sense that he is the sort of son that she might have expected to have. Yes. Now, was that your intention? Do you know, uh, that's... I have to say, I'm not trying to flatter you, but that's a brilliant observation. It but, was, ladies but, but and gentlemen, a brilliant <laughs> observation. But it's, it's, it's not, one occur, not one that occurred to Oh, really? To me. Well, uh, well you've done it brilliantly, it. unconsciously. Yeah, you put it so clearly, I think, why, that, why didn't that occur to me? <laughs> I will, of course, claim that in the future. Absolutely, uh, it is uh, yours. Uh, it is your play, after all. <laughs> but I, I think that's right. Uh, yeah. it's, and, of course, in terms of social class, that, that could have easily have happened. Mm. Mm. Uh, if he'd been a different boy, her hands. If, she, he, if, she, if he'd been the boy that his father wanted him to be, he, he could have been, he could have been the Gestapo mm. officer. Mm. Mm. And, it, it's so, and the way that you, you play that is so subtle that there isn't any unpleasant suggestion of flirtation or anything. There is admiration and a sense of, you know, you respect this strong, powerful woman. And she is always strong and powerful. And that's a great yeah. thing yeah. to see on a stage. I have to say, I, th I, I think... John Light and Penelope Wilton playing those, those roles have got that... It's a difficult thing to get right, actually, because it could become flirtatious, which would be almost disgusting, I think, yeah, if it had, had, had done. Uh, but there was potential for that, which I couldn't help as I, as I was mm -hmm. writing it, because they're, they're curious about each other. Uh, yes. but, but they're curious, I hope now, I mean, that's why I'm going to recruit what you've just said. They're curious <laughs> about each other because they can recognise each other, or she can recognise her son to an extent. I think that's probably true. And also, um, I think something that is important to remember um, is that there was a deal of genuine idealism at that point. Yeah. And a young man in the Gestapo then, 1933, believes he has a purpose yes. and doesn't want to believe that actually there's something rather nasty going on. I would push it further. I, I would say, and this is not to give idealism a bad name, but I, th I, I don't think it was just at the beginning. I think it was at the bitter end as well. That, that, that's mm. the tragedy of all totalitarian ideas, whether they be on the right in this case or on the extreme left, that there is an idealism there. Mm. It almost has to be mm. in order to activate the movement. Uh, it depends on believers. So it, it's not unusual. Mm. I, th I think what you might say, in 1933, he could still convince himself uh, that he didn't have blood on his hands, or a Gestapo officer could do that, uh, whereas it was you know, a little bit more difficult after 1938, and certainly I would have thought impossible after 1942. Mm. Did you uh, find, when you were writing the play, in terms of the, the scenes um, and making the decision of the order in which to tell it, because... Uh, you're clear in the programme note about this moment when Hans Litten put a certain Adolf Hitler mm. on the stand and made him look a fool. Um, now, you could have started with that, yes. but you don't. We won't say how you do it. Yeah. So, in terms of being a debut playwright, how did you go about negotiating the order in which you were going to tell the story and the fact that you are telling his story yes. stage left and her story yeah. stage yes. right, yeah. essentially. How uh, was that? And, and that's quite a simple plan, in a way. But, but what's probably... Uh, first of all, I didn't... I didn't I, 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 as I say, I, 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 the, the BBC uh, drama is, does put Hitler on the stand. We had mm -hmm. Ian Hart as, as, uh, as Hitler. And I, I said to... Uh, the producer who commissioned the script, we're not doing that again. And he was so relieved, actually, the idea of you guys seeing Hitler every night. Uh, or and they anybody... had that last year anyway with Arturo Ui. That, <laughs> yes, but that, that's a, that was know, a slightly just, move from, from uh, Hitler. Was, I'm not saying it's a demanding thing for an actor as well, not, a, not a, maybe a great role night after night. But uh, So it was always going to begin after the trial. But at the same time, it's really important to know what's happening to Hans is because of this bloody trial. So you, you, you have to give that information, in, uh, and I want to do that in dribs and drabs. And again, I, I won't say too much about how that's done. But as the story is pushing forward, a story of mother and son, and eventually it becomes connected, you're, there's something else that's going backwards in time, and that is you're getting more and more information. 
and therefore understanding the personal vicious motives of the men tormenting Hans. You're getting more and more information about what happened in that trial, to the point at the end, actually, you've, you, you've got the trial, I think. Mm. Well, hopefully, that, that, that was the intention. And, and did you uh, also, in that, want to take us as the audience from a place of certainty about what Hans Litton had done, that he had been moral and principled and he had yeah. said what nobody else was saying, to the point that any parent might ask themselves, was was it worth it? You know, yeah. did you have that yeah. moral arc, as it were, the questioning arc in your mind? But I, I wanted, I, I wanted Irmgard to, to be, uh, if not asking that question explicitly at the beginning, at least feeling that. And she's kind of prodded, actually, by, uh, by, by Fritz at various points, who is much, the father, who is much more uh, uh, eager or willing to ask, make that question explicit. Has my son been a fool? Not actually just because he's exposed himself and his family to uh, uh, acts of reprisal, but because there was an argument was at the time. He could, but actually because he gave Hitler wings. You know, you think of Hitler in 1931, on the, on the year of the trial, mm. was still trying to break into the mainstream in German politics. When it happened, it happened quickly, 30 to 33. And there was always a risk in what Hans did in, in getting this man to put him on the stand, to expose him to a charge of perjury, that would be the ideal thing, or to make his, uh, to bring out forward the, the contradictions in what he was doing, appealing to the thugs on the one hand, appealing to the respectable businessmen on the other. Hans said, enough of that, I'm going to expose that contradiction and both sides are going to hate you as a result and your movement will fall away. The danger, of course, in doing that was actually you, you allow him to bring the two together even more. So, and Dad always thought Hans had done that, I yes. think. And, and two, uh, it, it, there's a very clever suggestion that two men of conviction, two men possibly of arrogance. Yes, oh, uh, absolutely. You know, yeah. uh, that they're yeah. set again. And of course, yeah. again, the audience will know that <laughs> words will become very important all the way through yeah. the Reich and the justifications yes. are written down always, yeah. Um, so... I'm glad you said he was arrogant, Hans, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he... Because he, I think he had to be to do that. Well, uh, well, I think that's what I thought was an incredibly um, brave and absolutely, it pays off, decision for you as a playwright, was um, it's cleaner, it's easier for our heroes to be heroes and our villains to be villains. But, of course, what is subtle and wonderful about theatre is that your mind is changed and you can see that it's not always the nicest people who are the best people. Mm. And so there was a sense, um, as we see him, of, you know, I sometimes wanted to go, Hans, you know what? Enough now. <laughs> <Yes>. You know, <laughs> this is not yeah, going to go yeah, well. Yeah. Um, you know, his friends actually said that to him as well in 31. They? Oh, yeah. they, 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 they tried to deter him, partly because of fear for him but partly because they couldn't feel fully share his enterprise. And they shared his politics, actually, but they couldn't share that enterprise. Mm. And they realised it was, uh, you know, it was a great gig for Hans. I that's to put it crudely, but to get Hitler up on a great, great thing for my career. And he, he, he did say later that uh, apparently he's, he rec this was recorded by, I'm not sure whether it was his mother or somebody who visited him, in, who knew him in concentration camp. He said, I wasn't actually, this is a moment of realisation, I guess, I'm not actually brave because I didn't think I was going to lose. Yeah. You know, that's a, a sort of, uh, it didn't occur to him that he, 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 could, he could actually personally suffer from what he'd done. Well, having talked about the meat of the history in the play, um, I, I don't want to go any further with that for fear of, um, of, of taking off some of the, the wonderful moments that you're going to feel when you see it. But I want to now talk to you writer to writer, I suppose. Um, I've written a couple of little plays and a lot of novels. <laughs> yes. And we were talking about this before, that um, with a novel, by the time I see somebody reading it, um, in a way, the paint is dry. Yeah. Um, and I am removed, I know what it is. You know, you learn, and you know, I launched my latest novel here, and I learned that night what the book was, in a way. But the experience of sitting in the audience for my first play and feeling the people around me reacting was both the most exhilarating writing experience I've ever had and the worst, <laughs> and the most terrifying. So how was it for you, Mark? <laughs> yeah, well, if, if anybody tonight feels eyes drilling to the back of their neck uh, and feel they've been watched, it's probably me. Uh, 
I, I was so aware of what everybody else... I, I've seen, I saw the first preview, that's all. This is my second time. Uh, and, and it was terrifying. I mean, I... I uh, because it's... Like Kate said, I mean, write, writing books, the product is finished, right? Making a, a film on television, you've seen it a hundred times in the edit, other people have seen it, you finally think it's good enough to release to the world. And, and, it, and it's pretty nerve-wracking, I guess, the night it goes out, but there's nothing else you can do. You, you, you've got a certain idea of how people might respond. I've got no idea how you guys will respond, and I didn't on the first night, so... Uh, and it means... It means I, I, I'm, I'm as much... <laughs> Tonight I'll be as much watching you or feeling you, as it were, than I will seeing the action on the thing. It's pretty terrifying. I think. And, and is it tempting when, if somebody gasps in what you might feel is the wrong moment or laughs? Oh, I'll tell them. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> we're going to put him down there in the in the tunnel. <laughs> um, but but as a as a writer. Does that make you want to go back into the rehearsal room and say, guys, that was really odd. Didn't you think that was odd that they yeah. did this rather than that? You know, when does the work become fixed I for you? I don't know you? yet. You don't know yet? I don't know. Do, uh, is I, it fixed or is it still a bit slippery? Is it... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly good anyway. I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm fairly good at revising stuff, even when I think it's fixed yeah. in, in my mind and improving stuff. There comes a point where diminishing returns set in, but that's usually because too many people are telling you to change stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and... And you, you've started off thinking they're all right, and now you realise that they're all wrong. Yeah, yeah. it happens to us all, huh? Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, I don't know whether, whether I shall feel... I don't, I don't know what to expect, actually. I think the next week, and week and a bit especially, will be interesting to see if I do feel that way, or, or whether things which I thought were funny, because... You, you can never eliminate jokes from anything, not even totalitarianism. It's that people will always respond, which is why there are hopefully humorous moments in, in the show as well. I don't know whether the people will find them funny or, or they'll be so, so appalled by what's happening around that they won't laugh. I, I, I'll be second-guessing all the time, I guess. Mm. But, uh... I always find, um, sitting in the audience, that in something that matters and is uh, challenging in whatever way, the need for release through laughter is quite important. Yeah. So, oddly, the more serious the play, the more likely that when there is a moment, there will be an extraordinary sort of... <gasps> well, we'll see. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. they did happen, I, I felt, thought, on Friday. You know, they, you could yes. feel people. Um, yeah. The other thing, um, you know, I presume you, you go to the theatre and you love theatre, because yeah. otherwise you wouldn't have said yes to writing a play. Sure. It wouldn't have been your thing. Um, was the process... As you expected, did you have an expectation of how it would be, and what have you particularly liked or particularly found different? Yeah, uh, well, in a, in a sense, I'm still on a way territory because I still feel myself writing. Uh, uh, as you know, I've, I've spent years and years and years and years in television, uh, so this is still a way, uh, the away ground for me. So, I've, and but I, I, I have loved it. I have to say. Because maybe because of the pacing, because of the traditions of theatre, the, the way you rehearse, uh, the way things are commissioned, I feel the writer gets a lot more respect, maybe than te than television, mm. uh, especially as you as you know when you're writing for television, nobody nobody seems to care at the beginning, and then everybody cares at the end because there's, because uh, they, because things <laughs> become very expensive at the end, <laughs> and also people can't use their imaginations, so they only respond to stuff they can actually see on the screen. That's a criticism not of anybody here. That's not the, not, not, not the audience. I'm talking about the com people who commission stuff. Mm. Mm. And I've, I've, but I've never felt anybody... Uh, so, therefore, there's a disrespect that comes with that, I think. Yes. You but don't understand why I've written that. Well, there isn't time. I don't need to understand it. Let's just do it, you know. Mm. I've, there's been nothing of that. There's been an intensity in examining the script, which I'm not used to. And is that by the actors. enjoyable? Lovely. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You, feel, you feel kind of important, you yeah, know, yeah, apart yeah. from anything else. And when they say, um, you know, something like, you know, this happened to me, and this lovely actress said, very embarrassed, she said, I'm, I'm really sorry, Kate, I just don't think she would say that. Yes. And, of course, as a writer, you feel blessed at that moment because it means that the character has got breath yeah, in her, you do. which means that somebody else yeah. thinks that they know her better than you. Yes. And that's a great moment, isn't because it? Because you can feel that ownership being, being yeah. uh, handed over, yeah. if you like. Yeah. And, and, and I, uh, I theoretically, I accepted that. And therefore, it, it, came, it, it came... It wasn't a shock when it happened, it was, it, but it was a nice thing, and I think I probably embraced it as well. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Because somebody else cares 
as much as me, and, and I care a hell of a lot. So if somebody else is doing that, that yeah. as well, that's a fine thing. And if, the, the other thing I wonder, did you... Um, the, the process of collaboration, because of course you have Jonathan Church, who is the artistic director here, but also a wonderful director. You yes. have Matthew Scott, who is a brilliant associate music man who yeah. liberates all of those things, and that's very important. And of course, barnstorming performances, not least yes. of all from Penelope Wilton, yeah. who is so measured and poised and never lets it become sentimental or no. mawkish. So was that process of, you know, design, lights, music, was that new or is yeah. did that feel similar to what you have in television it didn't it didn't feel similar at all i mean the, the, you, obviously the levels of expertise are the same and sometimes the same people are doing it uh certainly certainly as far as the actors go uh i just did something with uh the last thing i did for television I had ian mcdermott and a number of kind of mm. great mm. Uh, british actors who were at home probably even more home on the stage yeah. so i i, I sense that level i'm not saying there wasn't a level of seriousness there but it's it's uh what surprised me, uh, and, I, and everybody said, oh, when, you, when we go to do the full, first full dress rehearsal here, mm. the tech rehearsal and everything, uh, something you don't normally have, or even, or if you have, you don't see in a, on a television set in, in a drama. Uh, but when you come here, and you, you, you're welcome to come along, you, it'll be just pure chaos. You know, the th things, it'll, it'll look like chaos, but it actually it isn't. People are just learning stuff and learning it quickly and adapting. And, but I did sit here, and I, I, can, I, did be, <laughs> I was a little bit worried then, because it just looked <laughs> like the whole thing was maybe my fault as well. I, I'd, I'd written things which couldn't actually be enacted on the stage, and here I was seeing it in reality. And, but actually, all these professional people just kept a straight face and kept on doing it, and, and we could see it improve during the course of the day. So. And so... But well, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I think I know the answer to this now, having chatted for, the, for, the, for these minutes, and I'm going to throw the questions out, you know, to the audience in a moment. Do you want to write more plays now? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. Yeah. My appetite has been stoked, yes. Yeah. And are you waiting... And I'm thinking of doing it already, yes. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah. that is interesting. So that... So, and do you feel anxious about us, the audience, or tomorrow, them, the press, that yeah. we all, you know, like to uh, throw, throw things at? Yeah. Uh, or do you feel that the process has been so creative and wonderful that that, that, it, that is intact, regardless yeah. of what happens next? Ah, that's, that's a hard question to answer. I'm used, I'm used to reviews in the press. Mm. Do you like uh, them? I know what terrible reviews are like. No, I don't like those. No. Uh, but I know what good reviews are like. I, I, I do, I read them. Do you? Yeah, absolutely. And I shall be doing that... Uh... Do you read them so that you are informed and you don't leave your company, you know, having to manage you? Or do you read them because you want to learn from what they say? Bit of both. And, and also, uh, I, I don't, it's something about uh, leaving something unread that somebody else has read. I, yes. I, I need to know the worst, if the worst is out there. Hmm. And, uh, brave man. Horror, horror, well, no, no, it's, I'm not, that's not bravery either, because it's, it's uh, the brave thing to do. We would we'll say, who the hell cares? And uh, I, don't, I don't care whether you've, you, you know the bad news, and I don't. Hmm. Water for duck's back, but I don't feel like that. The audience reaction, again, that, that's, that, now that's very different, because there are ways uh, on television and film where you can monitor you get a certain amount of feedback, and of course, Twitter is alive now with instant reactions. Not, not all of which, you know, is, is, is good news, but... Uh, <laughs> not all uh, of which has been governed by thought, do, actually, do people, do people, we might say. <laughs> do people tweet when they're reading your books? Uh, no, not... Or do they do it after they they're They tend to do it afterwards, and... Um, oh, that's, that's OK. Yes, and it, some people, some writers attract... Um, because of the nature of their work, uh, as many uh, loyal haters as loyal lovers, yeah. as it were. Yes. Um, whereas I mostly am lucky in that people, if they've enjoyed The Taxidermist Daughter, say, which is my new one, will, will tweet and tell me so. I haven't had anybody going, I hate this book, because in a way they can't be bothered, because yes. 
Why yes. would you? Yes. You know, you know, they probably stopped before they got to the end. Except you know? the internet is live with people like that as well, isn't it? They are. You see, I, I don't go playing on the internet for precisely that reason. That's why I say it's brave, you know. And there, many people here will have heard my interview with Toby Stevens a couple of years ago, the actor Toby Stevens, yeah. who was here in Private Lives. And when I asked him about reviews, he sort of went, you know, he did that, that thing. Um, and I said, oh. And he said, I can quote you every single word of the very worst review I ever had. And he'd got it like in 1987. Brilliant. Um, and at that point, I thought, yes, you probably shouldn't read your reviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we have the house lights up so I can uh, see, see you? Welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, does anybody have a question that they would like to start with? Lady at the back, thank you. I'm interested, you mentioned the every woman notion. Um, and the protective mother. I have had some experience of a confirmed pacifist who, when her son was threatened, immediately turned into a murderous beast. Uh, and I'm reminded of Christabel Bielenberg, um, in the past is myself, being interviewed by the Gestapo and commenting on the translation of fear into fury. Is it a female thing? That, that's, that's a very do you think affect men in the same yeah, way. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, essentially, whether the idea of the translation of fear into fury is a particularly female thing, or is it a parent thing, or you know, what would you say, having done all the yeah. research? Yeah, uh, uh, well, I, 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 I don't feel qualified to give a definitive answer to that. I, I think. It's, I, I think it's both. I think it's a mother. It's, it's, it's the... Uh, to, to, to translate fear, uh, fear into fury means not being... Not, being uh, not caring about the consequences, doesn't it? You have to, you have to, you have, to have a certain status to, to, to do that. I don't mean a social status, but you have to have a stake that is so personal that allows you to do that. Now, either you're a saint and the stake is humanity, or it's, or you're a parent, and the stake is your child, uh, or a husband and a wife, etc. I, I, I think it's uh, the, the, the only other people who probably are able to do that. And history says that even then they're in a, a, they're in the minority, are the ones who are probably facing their own destruction. And I say that because there's a character tonight in a play who turns that. Fear, but even that is still this fury is so intermingled with fear. Uh, I can't. It's not a common. It's not a common condition. Uh, so although it comes out of parents, it probably doesn't come to every parent. That's all I can say. Thank you. Is there another question? Uh, the convention of your play is that your character should really be speaking German. Yes. The speakers are in German. Yeah. Yes. They speak to each other in English. Yes, presumably. yes. No, no, it's in German. <laughs> <laughs> it's in English. Um, so, as we know that language shapes thought um, and reaction and sense of humour in the case of the Germans, I just wondered whether you had it in mind as you were writing that actually these are German people, their thoughts would be German, or whether you were simply writing as though they were all English. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I mean, I was aware of that uh, as, a, as a way of doing it. Uh, I thought if I, I, if I did that, and I didn't even try and do that on a page and see how it went, because I think if, I, if, if I'd been aware of that, it would have been a, an extra weight I didn't, I didn't really need. And I might have come up with a terrible pastiche of high German from the turn of the century, you know, not, you know, the last century. So... Uh, in terms of language alone, I'd say I, I, I certainly didn't do that, no. In terms of, obviously, cultural references, what an educated German might have known in the 1930s, of course, that's key and that's important. And what they know is, is different. There's an overlap, clearly, with other European cultures and with British culture at the time. But there's also some, something distinctive about it. So I tried to... and. I knew enough about Ermgard to know she was a highly cultivated woman steeped in German culture. So that was important for the characterization, but the language, no. Uh, I think that it's such an interesting question, because one of the things that is so um, 
magnificent, I think, about Penelope Wilton's performance is that there are moments when she is so clearly a German woman reacting in a way that a German woman would react, yeah. where not, not um, cold quite, but a, a sense of uncompromising, sort of look straight between the eyes, whereas a, an, an English woman of that period would have done it differently. Yes. And I did feel that from time yeah. to time, and I thought yeah. that was very marked, actually. Yeah. But you do, um, you pepper the play with some German, so that there is the cadence and shape of that language for yeah. us on the yes. stage. Yes. Well, there, there is a, there is a, can I mention a song, or is it, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do a really no. show, no. No. Yeah, well, I, I mean, saying there that there's no a song. song is not giving that much away, to be honest. <laughs> there is a song, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to let you... <laughs> and uh, feel free to join in. <laughs> if you know the German. Exactly. Yeah, there we go. Another question. Gentleman there. Um, <clears throat> so, I don't know the story, but I'm intrigued by the sort of uh, pre-reading. Um, I understand there is a Jewish element to the story and a collapse of the vinyl. So that's, I'm just interested to know to what extent those two elements could be brought in. And then following up on this question, do you plan to take the play to Germany? Right. So do you, I got half of that. No, OK, okay so, the, so the question is um, wonderful, because the gentleman was saying he didn't know much about it, but was intrigued. So this is good. Yeah. That's, one, that's one customer. Um, and um, then said, was interested if there were, you know, had, had realised from reading this that there was a Ju Jewish element yes. involved. Yes. And the second question was about whether you can anticipate the play going to Germany. Uh, I, 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 it'd be interesting. I, 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 the first bit, yes, there is a Jewish element involved. Uh, and again, I won't say too much about that because it's, there's a... There's a, there's a the plot largely hangs, well, uh, part of the plot hangs on that, uh, on that, uh, on that uh, very question. But uh, I, c I don't know, it'd be, a, it'd be a real experience to take it to Germany. Uh, we might then run into difficulties because they might think uh, there's a translation which is so English and its mannerisms and its cadence and, and, and its even its cultural references, perhaps, I don't know, that they may, may not even buy it, I, I don't know. But it, it would be, personally, I would love that to happen because it would be going back to Berlin, not as a documentary maker now, but as, but as somebody with a, with a production about... Hans Sutton's story is better known there, but it's still not considerably known. Uh, it's, but it's, his name has a certain register, and that will be interesting in itself uh, because he's to deal with a more, slightly more iconic figure than he could ever be in Britain until after this goes out, of course. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but fun funnily enough, I think that it would find enormous audience in Germany because one of the things that is so important, and you alluded to it at the beginning, mm. in that this one man's tragedy became so overwhelmed by the terrible, terrible uh, loss of life. But there were... Germans were fighting against Hitler yes. all the way through. And then a lazy shorthand comes in that it's about Britain versus Germany. It isn't. It's about Britain versus the Nazis. Um, and so, you know, that, that is quite... An, and that's very clear. You're saying all these Germans were could, suffering. Could I, could I say something which is not going to spoil anything for anybody, but on that very question, when Ermgard... Uh, Ermgard died in the 50s, so she lived through the war, but she lived through the war in England, and she broadcast on the BBC... Uh, she, she broadcast uh, 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 in German to Germany from the BBC and she broadcast in English to English mothers. So uh, there is, that, that's, and her, that's, that was precisely her message, of course. We Germans, many Germans, st including my son, stood against Hitler from 1930. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, so I think that would be, and yeah. are you interested in writing? The third part? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> oh, I thought I was about to get a, the exclusive out of you there. No, no, no. Um, is there one final quick question? Do you... uh, yes, well, I wondered whether you had any idea of who you would love to have play of God or any of the other parts. Did you have any say in that? In, in, in who is in cast. the casting in the, cast. in the first instance? Uh, I, I didn't get any balls rolling, no. But, of course, when names were mentioned and... Uh, then uh, 
But I, I didn't, I wasn't in the mood to veto either because I, I, I put my hands, put myself and this production into the hands of people who really knew what, uh, who were strongly opinionated, of course, and knew business better than I did. There is, there is actually an actor I've worked with before, and that's Alan Kaduna, who plays uh, uh, Omgar's husband, who, I, fortunately, I, I loved and still do. But, uh, so, but, but the rest of the decisions weren't, weren't really mine, except I was given the respect of saying, do you like this person? Or, you know, do you think this will work for the character? And obviously has. And uh, absolutely. I wanted, yeah. I wanted Conra uh, the Gestapo officer to be younger than uh, Penelope, mm. quite a bit younger. Mm. Uh, and that was, that was, that was something that I, I, I always insisted yeah. on. Well, I right. mean, you know, it's, I, I think you, you, I hope you can tell from the people who have seen it. Um, yeah. That it feels the theatre feels very alive for okay. this, which is a wonderful thing, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like you to have great fun, uh, great enjoyment of this wonderful play tonight, or when you go in to see it, and to join me in thanking Mark Hayhurst. Fantastic play. Thank you. Thank you.